One of the greatest college basketball players I've ever seen and really transformed an entire conference. His name is Ralph Sampson, and he is joining us on the show today. I actually actually met his daughter at my former employer about Absolutely. three years ago. A wonderful young lady. Yeah, she was there for a little while. Yeah, loved it, enjoyed it. Pull that mic up, yep. Ralph. You know, you see the one-and-done culture today. I believe you stayed in college for three years. You could have been the three-time college basketball player of the year, if I recall. You were a – you and Patrick Ewing are the two most dominant college players I have ever seen. Would you have been able to leave one-and-done? Were you mature enough to do that? Well, I stayed four years, graduated from Virginia four. in 1983, and I was I had a chance to come out in high school, and I did not um, choose to come out because I was 190 pounds soaking wet, <laughs> and you coming out, you playing Kareem, Robert Parrish, oh, Moses Malone, <laughs> Daryl Dawkins, so those guys were you know, grown men, so I wasn't quite physically ready to come play. And then I had Brad Arback come to my house, my parents' house, and had a million dollars in a briefcase. What? and said, come out and play for the mighty Boston Celtics. So Kevin McHale would not have gone to the Celtics that year. So they literally, you were a high schooler. I was a high schooler. And they brought a million dollars in a bag to your house. Yep, yep. And you said no. Said no. What did your, I, I, what did your parents, uh, I mean, it was a family decision. That's an awfully mature decision, Ralph. Well, you know, looking at my mom and dad, they, and I said, are we okay? Are you guys okay? I said, you know, we worked all, our, all of our lives, and – we okay, and when you're ready to go, you'll tell us. So it's not the money thing, it's are you ready to play? And my mother played basketball in high school, and so she kind of knew some of the ins and outs of a very passionate family about the game of sports and just life itself. So I wasn't ready. I just wasn't ready to, ready to, to leave that setting yet. You go to Virginia, which is, I believe, the number one public university in America. Yeah, it yeah. is a remarkable university. Cal on the West Coast and Virginia on the East are the best non-private schools, education in America. Uh, you had to be a good student, so you go there, and you transform the ACC. You know, we think of Carolina, yeah, yeah. and then Ralph Sampson. Did you feel like sometimes your sheer height, your domination, did you sense how important you were to the sport, Ralph? You know, not at that point in time, no, because uh, you, you don't kind of understand the importance of the school or the hype. But after my freshman year, went into NIT and understanding that, and then all the media attention we got my second and third and fourth year, you understand it at that point in time. And so you can imagine playing in the NIT of Madison Square Garden winning, and then you want to cover Sports Illustrated, and it just kind of goes from there. The second year, we go to the Final Four against um, – North Carolina, Michael Jordan, Al Wood had a, a phenomenal game. I still hate you, Al, but it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> but had a game that's the year, you know, the president got shot and the whole deal with that and, and, and the playoff game. But you, you start to hear it, and then you start to feel it. And then you get passionate about it, and then you just work your tail off every day to be the best you can be. So I knew kind of after my second year kind of what was going on, but I had no clue my freshman year. Yeah, you, and, I, and I say this seriously, folks. How old are you, Ralph? 56. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm early 50s. Growing up as a teenager, you were the center of college basketball. <laughs> and when I met your daughter, she was so pleasant. And I told her that. I said, no idea. Like, Virginia became the talk of college basketball. So let, let's go to the Michael Jordan thing. When you played him, he's always had kind of a relentless motor. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a great shooter back then. But did you sense, Ralph, you know, everybody now is a genius. Did you, when you watched Michael, did you think, because he went third. It's not right. like he was a second-round pick. Right, right, right. Did you sense there was another gear well, I mean, you could sense that we played against Michael a number of years in, in college, and, yeah. and we played a game down in uh, Carmichael down in North Carolina, and guy Othell Wilson and Ricky Stokes were bringing the ball up. They, they were down. Michael guarded the guard. He, they took him off the two-man and put him on the point guard. Okay. And he stole the ball twice and went down and goes down and dunked it, and then they ended up winning the game. So you could sense his – his passion about his the game, motor. his motor, but also, you know, he always says, only one that ever held Michael back was Dean Smith. Right. That's from scoring, but you can sense his ability, but you know, when you got Michael, Worthy, you got a, a cast of guys. Sam Perkins was. You can't, you, I mean, he can't score all the points <laughs> at that point in time, especially in the college game. Was there ever a player in college? I, I, I um, it was before you, David Thompson, who yep. I thought, had yep. he been healthy, could have been the greatest player ever. Oh, yes. But, I was always shocked that Pearl Washington didn't work in the NBA. You know, you you lived this life 10 years in the NBA. Um, so much of the NBA to me is maturity. Yeah, absolutely. It really, Ralph, people just think it's all talent. 
you ever play with guys in college or the pros that you thought had great talent and just weren't mature enough? Absolutely. Uh, mature enough or had the passion to play. What makes LeBron James LeBron James? Is his passion with Mike, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, those guys that are elite Hall of Fame players, what's different than a Michael Beasley? Who's Michael, really good. Michael Harold, Beasley yeah. is really, really good, but does he have a passion to play? You know, does he have the will to, to want to play and be that way every day? And you got to wake up with that passion every day. You got to go to bed with it. You got to sleep with it. You, you got to want it every day. Today, and I think it's the difference. Today's NBA, we have really marginalized the center, Ralph. <laughs> um, if you broke in today, would you have to shoot a jumper? I, you know, I wanted to shoot jumpers in high school, you know, and I had a college, high school coach because everybody would play a boxer one and two. Of course. And a zone, so I had no choice. And I would that's where I learned to dribble because – You I, could dribble. I, I three, oh, by the way, I, I love that people. highlight. Oh, God, look at this. Hold on. What's look at dribble. you. You were there seven. We go. <laughs> And I could do that today. I'd be I'd be five hundred million dollar player, right? But and then you could post up and do stuff like that against Kareem and and Artis Gilmore right there. But you know they wouldn't let me shoot threes with Bill Fitch and the Houston Rockets when I came into the league. God, look at that, Ralph. So just God, the, Ralph. Nature of the beast. Look at that. Who, by the way, teammate or opponent? You played in an era where mm -hmm. centers dominated the league. Yes. Who did you fare well against? That's a great and. Anybody give you trouble that was an under? I always said Nate Thurman as a kid. Who was an underrated NBA big? You know, I hated the undersized big guys. Dave Cowan, like D uh, Dave Cowan, was six foot eight, six foot nine. You know, power forward. Uh, Maurice Lucas was became a good friend of mine. Rest in peace. But he 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 would he would come and punch me in the chest before the tip off, and say, "Big fella, I'm here." So, but, he, <laughs> but that's just Maurice. And then after. You know, we both retired. I see him. I, I punch him back in the chest. I say, take that because I owe you so many of these punches because you got me in the game. So he tried to intimidate you. All, every day. Uh, not only on the court, but off the court. But, you know, he was sweet guy, though. He was a sweetheart of a guy. And then uh, so you, guys like that that were undersized. In college, I hated Buck Williams. Buck was, was a tough guy. Tough and undersized. And Maryland. Mean. Maryland. Tough, Played dude. well in the league. By the way, the how Nets. Kareem? I love playing against Kareem. Uh, me and Akeem Olajuwon love to play. Kareem is tough. He was strong, Scott Hook, unstoppable, 37,000 points. But we loved to play. We had a strategy. Akeem would play him, and I could go and try to block the Scott Hook, which we probably never did once or twice in, in our career. But I always loved coming to the Lakers and playing against Magic, Kareem, Cooper, Worthy, Scott, because that was the best of the best, supposedly, and you wanted to, you wanted to beat him to death. You know? Former number one pick in 1983, a multiple-time All-Star, played nine years in the NBA. Uh, Ralph Sampson joining us. College basketball today is, I, I compare it to a, an airport. You land, <laughs> you land on that plane, and you just, you're, you're just going to basically stay there for as short a time as you can, then you go to the NBA. I've been arguing this for the last couple of years. College basketball matters. It does. And don't tell me it's better to go play in Europe. Ralph, when you look, give me a life lesson that you would not have had. Had you gone to Europe? Had you done one and done? Where did college help you? Yeah, it's a maturity factor. Look at the guys that are one and done now. I, I go back to uh, Rasheed Wallace and, and people that do oh, Carolina or the one and done type guys. Look at um, Anthony Davis. You know, he, he's six, seven years in the league now. He was He's a good player, but after about three years, he matured. Now he's a great player. So if he'd have stayed in school another year or two, by the time he got to NBA, he'd have been a really good player in his first or second year of the league. So I think the maturity, especially the big guy, uh, it takes a little bit longer for them to mature uh, in college, and they could get that. But in, to go to the NBA, they don't have time to mature because they got to play every night, play every day. Look at Ben Simmons. You know, he, unfortunately, he got hurt last year, right? And he stays out a year, and what he, he works out, he works his tail off, and now he's a pretty good player. Yeah. But it took a year for him to really mature, but he was just off the court. Look at, you know, Nabib. They take, bring him along slowly. He's a big guy. He's maturing now. But, it, you know, injuries and things By that happen. Your body, Ralph. The body is the temple. If you don't take care of it, it's going to. I always remember the Sports Illustrated shot <laughs> of you doing the 50-pound barbells. You, mm -hmm. were, you were thin. but you They were, were 90. 90? Yeah. Dumbbells. Yeah, you were strong. Well, you know, when, coming into UVA, I was 7'1", 190 pounds. And you graduated, you were what? I graduated with 7'4", 
245. Holy moly, that's a handful. But, you know, I had, I had big strength coach. I got him, John Gamble, that was a powerlifting coach. He's a weight coach for the Buffalo Bills now. But he was a powerlifter, so I would lift with those guys every day. And I would lift with football players because uh, basketball players, we lifted, but they didn't lift like I did. So you I gained was, 50 pounds. Gained 50 pounds. Ralph, absolute pleasure. Oh, it's all mine. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from the newest show on FS1. First Things First with Chris Carter and Nick Wright.